Hello. We're going to be talking about the periodic table and taking some notes on the periodic table today. So you need to get out of the orange packet, page 13. We're going to start with some history of the periodic table. Okay, first of all, Johann Wolfgang Dobereiner in 1829 sorted elements into triads based on similarities. Sorted elements into triads, that's groups of three. John Newlands in 1865 discovered that when elements were listed by atomic mass, they were separated by intervals of eight. So every eighth element repeated itself. Mendeleev took all the elements, wrote down the, el the uh, properties of the element on cards, and taught, put them out kind of like solitaire, if you've ever played solitaire with cards. He played them out and looked for similarities and properties that repeated. And this is how he came up with what he eventually became. Uh, He's usually um, recognized as the father of the periodic table, even though there were lots of contributions. The biggest thing he did was left spaces where he thought undiscovered elements would fit. <laughs> Our uh, current, um, the, the develop of the modern periodic table is Glenn Seaborg. Seaborg rearranged things so that they were by atomic number Mendeleev did it by atomic mass. All right. Now, this is a picture of Mendeleev, Mendeleev's uh, periodic table. And if you look, here's group one. Lith oh, that's, I thought maybe that would be a highlighter. Let's see. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. If you look at your periodic table, those guys all are in the first column, column 1A. Group 2, beryllium, calcium, they have zinc and sulfur, which don't match up, but barium certainly does. Group th 3, we have boron and aluminum, and so on and so forth. So there were a lot of similarities that Mendeleev found, and then he had some spaces left, like here, he knew there must be one that fit there that had about a mass of 68, but he didn't know what it was. So he left it blank in case it showed up. Okay? Now, the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number. Mendeleev did it in increasing atomic mass, although there were a couple spots where the properties didn't fit if he did it by mass. We'll talk about that later. Um, but to the pro proper way now is by increasing atomic number. And this leads us to the periodic law. The periodic law, when the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, there is a periodic pattern in their physical and chemical properties. Periodic pattern. Mean, I mean, periodic just means a pattern. It's something that repeats. Magazines are actually called periodicals because they come out at a regular interval. When I was a young person, even when I first started teaching, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the ability to look magazine articles up online, so you went into the library to the periodical desk, and there was something called the Reader's Guide to Periodic Literature, and you could, if you say you were researching elements, you could look in that guide, it would tell you, oh, Discover Magazine had an article on May 12th, 2000, or 1000, uh, 1980, and maybe Time Magazine had an article on elements in June of 1980, so on and so forth. So you would look up those articles that way. It was very tedious. And then you had to either make copies on the photocopier or hand write out all your notes. Let me tell you, be happy you can cut and paste, okay? So the periodic law, periodic patterns just means repeating. Weekdays are periodical. 
because you Monday comes after Sunday, Tuesday comes after Monday. TV shows are periodical. The TV Guide is a periodic uh, per, um, magazine because it comes out once a week. Um, women's menstrual cycles are referred to periods because they happen for a lot of us on a regular basis. Some of us, not so much. But a lot of are, are on a very reliable cycle, which is periodic. All right. When we look at the periodic table, we talk about groups which are up and down. Groups are the up and down columns. I will probably call them families, okay? Because the reason they're named families is because they share characteristics with one another, which you guys discovered in the card sort that you did last week. Okay. Periods, on the other hand, are what we refer to as the rows going across. The family has similar characteristics. The periods have characteristics that change as you go through, but then you'll see that same pattern repeated on the next row. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level of an atom. We've talked very briefly about electrons. We said that Bohr said that they were in outer energy levels. There are different amounts that fall into each energy level, that each energy level can only hold so many. The outermost energy level is referred to as the valence. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Well, Valence electrons are those outer shell electrons, the outermost shell. Now the next picture in your notebook says metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. If you turn the page, I got a little bit more detailed. So we're not going to fill in those boxes at the bottom. So go ahead and turn to page 14. Up at the top, top it gives you the modern periodic table. We've already seen this. The elements are arranged by increasing number of um, atomic number, the number of protons, and then you have a blank space that should have been on the next line. That is for Dmitry Mendeleev, who we just met, the name back here, Dmitry Mendeleev, is considered the father of the periodic table. I said that earlier. All right. And I, it, this has a little blurb that, that describes how he, your, your notes have that blurb, how he created the periodic table. All right, go on down to where it says metals. Metals are good conductors of electricity and heat. This is why you don't want to use a metal spoon if you're making mac and cheese and you're going to leave the spoon in the pan because it'll get hot. You want, if you're going to leave a spoon in the pan, you want to use a wooden spoon. Uh, metals are solid at room temperature except for mercury. Gallium will melt in your hand. Malle metals are malleable, which means they can be hammered into thin sheets. They are ductile, which means they can be drawn into thin wires. And they form positive ions, meaning they lose electrons when they bond. Nonmetals are poor conductors of heat and electricity. And that's down underneath transition metals. They have low boiling points and melting points. Many are gases at room temperature. The ones that are solid are brittle and they form negative ions. And here's a nice little diagram. Metals you can see are in green on here. They make up the left half. Nonmetals are up in the upper right hand corner. And we're going to talk about transition metals and metalloids here in just a moment. All right, transition metals are this bridge in between. And sometimes these two are considered transition metals, sometimes they're not. I still tend to refer to them as rare earth elements because that's what they were when I was young. But 
Transition metals are basically forming a bridge between the first two families of metals and then the metals over here. Okay, so I, that's thrown in there. Now we're going to skip down the metalloids. The metalloids are these guys right along here that are purple. They have properties of both metals and nonmetals. They are good semiconductors. That's where you're going. That's the word you're going to recognize. They're good semiconductors, which means they will allow electrons to move, but they don't move freely. They can move slowly, and this is why they're so useful in um, electronics. Silicon is a non-metal, and I mean a metalloid. Ger germanium is a metalloid. Both of those are used in um, electronics. Rare earth elements underneath that. There's no fill in the blanks to go there, but we tend to refer to this row as the lanthanide because lanthium is the one, lan, lananthum, I can't talk, is the one that starts there, and acti actinide because actinium starts the next row. These guys actually fit in here, and you'll see that in class. They go right there, if we cut that in two. All right. Um, rare earth elements are usually, or a lot of them are man-made, meaning they're synthetic. They are radioactive, and they a lot of times have some good properties. The actinides, which is the bottom row, are all radioactive. All right, now we're going to get into the the body of the periodic table. Hydrogen. What? Oops. Okay, somehow I'm making that go, and I don't know how I did that. Hydrogen. When, again, Mrs. Bush story, when I was young, hydrogen wasn't attached to the periodic table in my chemistry classroom in high school. It was actually set above the periodic table. Hydrogen has one thing in common with that first family, and that is it has one outer shell electron. Otherwise, it's a gas, it's a non-metal, and everybody else in the family is metal. So it doesn't fit. It is not an alkali metal. Ironically enough, when I was in high school, we used to make fun of hydrogen because about that time there had been a story come out that the Russian scientists had taken hydrogen, cooled it down to about four degrees Kelvin, and it was solid and it conducted electricity. So maybe it does belong in the family if you can get it solid. Who knows? The alkali metals are everybody under hydrogen. And I guess we're going to go ahead and start with those notes. The alkali metals have one valence electron. They are less dense than other metals. They are highly reactive. If you put them in water, they will react. They are not found naturally in elemental form. They're always in a compound. They can be cut with a knife. They are good conductors of heat and electricity. And they form positive one ion. Okay, you can see in the picture that, and my, oh, there he is, the circle showed up. They're cutting a piece, I'm assuming that's lithium, but I don't actually know. They're cutting a piece of lithium with a knife, okay? Alkaline earth are next. The alkaline earth metals are group 2A, they have two valence electrons. They are also soft, but not as soft as alkali metals. They also are not found naturally in nature. They're only in compounds. They are silvery white in color, and they are somewhat reactive with water, and they form two plus ions. That means they give up two electrons. Transition metals is the next thing on your sheet. The transition metals are have varying number of ele valence electrons, which means they're multivalent. Your sheet says form 
multivalent cations, meaning more than one positive cation. For instance, iron can be a plus two or a plus three. Vanadium can be a plus two, a plus three, a plus four, or a plus five. So they form multiple cations. And they form bright, brightly, they're present in different shells. They form alloys. They conduct heat and electricity. And most important, well not most importantly, but one that is commonly talked about, they form brightly colored compounds. And this slide shows you these are solutions. So they've taken salts. Titanium plus three salt, when you dissolve him in water, he gives you a purple color. Vanadium can give you either a purple, a green, a blue, or a yellow. Chromium, blue, green, and orange. Manganese, some pinks. Iron, a blue or a yellow, or a green or a yellow. Cobalt, a red. Nickel, a green. And copper, a blue. Okay, those are all properties of transition metals. Okay, we're moving left to right. The other metals, sometimes called the poor metals, and so now you can feel sorry for them. Aw, oh, poor metals. There's my dad joke. All right, the poor metals are found in this little corner. The metalloids are right here. Transition metals are over here. The metalloids are found in this little corner. Not metalloids, the poor metals or the other metals. Let me erase what I just did because that's going to be a problem here in a moment. The poor metals have lower melting points than transition metals. They form cations. They are high in density. They are opaque. And they are found in the third fourth and fifth families, or third, fourth, and fifth columns, if you will, they are multivalent. Lead can be a plus two or a plus four. Tin can be a two plus or a two plus four. Uh, indium is a plus three. It only has one. All right, the next column we're going to look at. So if, if you think about this, we've looked at, oops, come on, come back. We've looked at this area. Mm, that was the poor metals. And we've looked at this area and this area. So now we're going to go on to the right, and we're going to be looking at the third column from the end. This is the chalcogen family. Group 6A, they have six valence electrons. They come from the Greek word chalkos. They are a mix of metals at the bottom, metalloids in the middle, nonmetals at the top. They form negative two ions, and they all have roles in biological functions, either as a nutrient or a toxin. You can see oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium in the picture. The next family, second to the end, is the halogen family. I'm beginning to think this is on a timer, and that's why it went so fast. The halogen family have seven outer shell electrons. They form salts. In fact, the name halogen means salt forming. They are very reactive. Fluorine and chlorine are both gases. Bromine is a liquid. It's one of two liquids at room temperature, the other being mercury. And then iodine is a solid. They form negative one ions, and they form what we call diatomic mole elemental molecules. Okay, Chlorine is always in a pair. Fluorine is always in a pair. Iodine is always in a pair. Bromine is always in a pair. I'm assuming tellurium would because it probably acts the same, but we're not going to worry about him right now. All right. And it means salt producing. I already said that, but now it's underneath where I wrote it. So let's run an eraser through that. Or not. Let's not run an eraser through. I'm having some issues. All right. Noble gas, the last family. Noble gases 
have eight valence electrons. That means they have, they're full. They're called noble gases because they don't like to react. Those energy levels are completely filled and they do not want to react with anything. Just like the nobility. Think about it. You, uh, princess in a pea has to marry a prince or Cinderella, no, Cinderella wasn't, she wasn't the princess. Aladdin, Jasmine has to marry a prince. Aladdin wants to be a prince, but he's a commoner, so he can't marry her. Noble, the nobility would not mix with the common folk. Noble gases will not mix with the rest of the atoms. Except on occasion, all right, come back, Xenon. Xenon is the only one because his, he is so big that sometimes we can coerce him if we meet fluorine, and we'll talk more about that later. All right.